Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Rita Garwood, Editor-in-Chief of The Monitor. Thanks for joining me, Rita. Hey, Jesse. I'm so excited to do this. I'm usually the one interviewing people, so this is a, a cool change of pace. No, and, and, and thank you again for agreeing to do this. It's funny, as Deb Rubin, you know, every now and then she's like, when can I come back on and interview you again? I'm like, people don't want to hear about me. They want to hear about you, Deb, so I can understand that side of it for sure. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of that, we, you should come on my podcast and I should interview you sometime. We should, okay. we should do a lot of these little swapping things. <laughs> I think hey, I'm, per I'm perfectly fine with that. Just no questions in advance, just ad hoc on the fly and then, you know. Oh, <laughs> living dangerously, that's awesome. <laughs> hey, hey. Open book, open book. But um, <laughs> Rita, for those people who might not be familiar with yourself, I mean, I wanna say that everyone gets this and everyone should see your picture on a regular basis. But for those who aren't familiar with you, just mind just kind of giving your career to date in equipment finance? Sure. So it, I'm in equipment finance <laughs> as uh, the editor in chief of Monitor. Um, but I came into it um, not actually in the publication, which is kind of interesting. Oh. Um, before I was here, I went to college for professional writing and I studied journalism and magazine writing. Um, and right before my senior year of college, I actually, my daughter was born and became a single mom. And I was looking for something that was a little bit more stable in a profession than like journalism, which you have to go to events and report yeah. on them and right. be there, you know, all hours of the day and night. So I actually got a job in a law firm and I worked there for five years. I did like bookkeeping, office management, things like that. And I was looking to make a change about five years later. And I found this uh, job ad at a publication company for a financial uh, administrative assistant. And I was like, oh, magazines, yeah. finance background, I can do this. <laughs> so I got the job and yeah. I started at this company, you know, doing accounts receivable and accounts payable, ordering lunch for people. <laughs> like, um, I was the receptionist, I answered the phone. And one of the first things I did was the Monitor 100, um, which is in front of those who aren't aware, our annual ranking of the top 100 companies in equipment finance. Um, and then over the years, um, actually it was a couple, it was a couple months into the role, the editorial team was saying, um, you know, they need some support for, for editing, copy editing. And I wound up raising my hands and saying, Hey, I'll, I'll help with that. Um, I have a background in this, I have a degree in it. And so I started there. Um, and I think it was 2015. Um, I actually joined the editorial team as editor of monitor. And over the years I got, you know, more promotions and, and today I'm editor in chief um, and and monitor itself started back in 1974. Um, it was created to support the communications of this recruiting company called Malloy Associates, which still exists today. Um, and it was this little tablet. It looked like a newspaper and they would send it out to their contacts just to you know show them job ads and things like that. But over the years, it turned into a magazine and I think Lisa Rafter, who was our current publisher, was really instrumental in making it what it is today. Um, in 1991, I believe, they started the annual ranking, the Monitor 100. Wow. And I, think I, didn't it was that was, I didn't realize it was that old. Yeah, it is. We did the 25th anniversary edition, like I think 2016 it was. Okay. Um, and in 1996, um, they launched the website Monitor Daily. <laughs> I um, saw an old version of the website. Did you ever go to one of those, uh, like way back, I forget the name of those sites where it shows you old versions of a website. Um, the original monitor website had this little squirrel mascot named, I think Webster or something. And it's like a picture of the squirrel at a news desk, like reading. Like you know what, sadly, I want to say maybe 20% of equipment finance organizations still have that old website as their That's new website. That, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's come so much farther than that over the years, um, particularly in the last couple of years. In 2018, Lisa Rafter, who's our current publisher, purchased the company from Jerry Parado, who is uh, our old publisher. And she has just taken the company in so many different directions. Um, over the last couple of years, we've launched podcasts, we launched live streams, we launched um, women equipment in equipment finance which was such an amazing issue to do yeah. I, I'm 
for years working under Jerry, I used to joke that everybody in equipment finance was just like a white guy. <laughs> it was like an old white guy in a suit. And, you know, it, you never knew. There's so many women and we get to focus on them now, which is fantastic. I love that. Lisa's really highlighted that for us. Um, we also launched a next generation leadership issue. Um, so we focus on, you know, rising stars who are 40 years or younger. You were one of those. <laughs> Was it last year, Jesse? You, you made it. You made I, made, I, I made it by that much. <laughs> we're probably about the same age because I, I just turned 41. So I'm, I'm too old uh, for that now. But <laughs> all right. yeah, no, I turned 40 in August. So I want to say that. I think I've made it by like four months, something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> not, so now I can just be top 40 while being 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we also uh, started the monitor uh, icon issues. So we, we focus on industry icons, people who've really made an impact. And we look at people as far as um, veterans who have been in the industry for a long time. We look at current leaders. We look at next generation people. We look at disruptors. And then finally, last year, we, we launched an innovation issue, and we yeah. uh, highlight the most innovative companies in the equipment finance ecosystem. So we look at not only just equipment finance companies, but service providers, maybe companies who are on the fringe of equipment finance who are providing something that, that gets us to that next level. So yeah, that's kind of me and Monitor. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a perfect way. I mean, the way that you guys, uh, I guess, ladies have pivoted that organization um, to maintain the relevance of this industry, especially what's happened in the last 24 months. Um, cause you know, I want to say in 2000, was it 19 was a monitor live series. Um, and they had some really good traction between the one in Philadelphia. And then there was the one in California just before this whole thing happened. Yeah, we had the monitor, it was called monitors disrupted. And the first one was in November of 2019. And that was amazing. I was at that event. It was, it was so cool. Um, yeah. And then I think it was February of 2020. We had the one in Newport Beach. I didn't get to go to that. Lisa went and she said on the way back, that was when she saw people wearing masks on the plane and she's like, oh, this might be serious. And then it was like two days later, everything shut down. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. No, it was great. The, the relevance you were able to continue with that, with your podcast, um, you know, because I really enjoyed where it was going. I was at that November event, um, enjoy where it was going and everything. And then to be able to maintain that, you know, throughout this last couple of years. Yeah. And the podcast, it's interesting because we started that when the pandemic hit, we contacted our editorial board and we said, you know, we really want to address this. Like, what can we do? And at that time, nobody really, really knew what was going on. Everyone was at home. Yeah. You know, we we're like, are people lending? What's happening? You, your own team is supposed to like leave your house, right? So right. everybody on our board agreed to get on the podcast and just talk about something um, related to the pandemic. And that's how it began. And then from there, it just, you know, we expanded talking to other other leaders in the industry. And, and today, I think we've recorded 53 of them to date recording one right after this so it'll be 54. That's, <laughs> that's awesome and is there any I guess the monitor disruptive series will that ever be making a comeback? We were or talking TBD? about it yeah TBD at this point I'm not sure people uh, really loved it but at this point I think it's TBD. TBD got it yeah well and um like you know I can appreciate all those things I mean the women in uh, leasing like that top one when it came out I was like that's a really cool idea and then you just constantly see the other ones and the way that that draws even more people in to the publication is amazing. Yeah, it is. We really appreciate that this industry is made up of people, right? Like everyone says, this is a family. Everybody yeah. cares about what everyone else is doing. And by having those little spotlights on people, um, it really helps to elevate them. It helps everyone in the industry to say, hey, look at this person, look what they're doing. And, you know, I think people appreciate that and they love reading about other people too. So sure. we're happy that we're able to do that. So besides the the monitor, um, I know there's ABF journal and do you guys have, a, do you have a few others that you'd like to talk about? Because I, I get the ABF journal updates, but I, I think there's a few others that I've never heard of. So yeah, so ABF journal is uh, the sister publication to monitor. Um, I don't remember exactly. I think it was launched 2001 and it 
basically covers the asset-based lending and specialty finance industry, covers like factoring and, you know, purchase order finance, accounts receivable financing. Um, and that's similar to Monitor. We have uh, quarterly print magazine issues, and then we also have a podcast and we have a daily newsletter. It's a kind of the sim same model. Um, we also publish on behalf of the International Factoring Association, a publication called Commercial Factor. And that is, um, it used to be a print magazine. We, we do one print magazine per year, and now we do a digital e-mag, and we do a weekly newsletter for them as well. And that's covering the factoring industry and, and all of the things that the IFA is, is doing. Um, and Dealmaker, we started publishing in 2019 on behalf of the National Alliance of Commercial Loan Brokers. Okay. Um, they are based in near New York, kind of near Albany, and they have an annual event. Um, it's usually in the fall, and it's a combination of commercial loan brokers and lenders. And they focus on you know various types of commercial lending. So it's equipment finance and asset based lending and factoring, but also you know some real estate fix and flip and um, SBA lending. So it's a broader sort of commercial finance than all the other publications, but they all are under the umbrella of commercial finance. So Dealmaker, we do six issues a year. Um, I actually am managing editor for that one as well. Okay. And we do something called Dealmaker Talks, which is kind of like a video series like we're, we're doing now. And we have a weekly newsletter for that too. So so of all these different things that are somewhat underneath the commercial finance umbrella, like are there reciprocities from each of these different industries? Anything yeah. that would stand out? They're all they're all connected, you know. Um, you see some crossover. We see crossover between ABF Journal and and Monitor, and between especially Dealmaker and all of them. I feel like they're all they're all connected in some ways. Like ABF Journal, we might go to the, the IFA conference and have a booth there. Um, uh -huh. Every it's 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 all a, a little ecosystem of commercial finance. So. <laughs> Perfect. And then are these all on the website too? So if people want to look up the information on them. They're not on the monitor daily website. Um, oh, okay. But they are, they have their own websites. There's abfjournal.com. Um, I think it's commercialfactor.com and then okay. dealmaker magazine. I think we'll I'm, I'm just curious. <laughs> I mean, as, as a person who's been a service provider for 16, 17 years, like it's like, well, I wonder who's playing in all of these spaces. Yeah. So, you do see crossover. It's it's interesting. Um, we all of the publications are on LinkedIn as well. If you if you go to my website, my uh, LinkedIn page, they're all I'm listed they're on there. as yeah, they're on there. You can find them that way too. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I just real quick want to talk about like your passion for writing. I mean, I, I got into writing a little bit over the last couple of years, and and I enjoy it. I think. Um, Someone asked me to write a, an article and they wanted it to be under 2000 words. I think I gave them five and I'm like, good luck. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just was extremely passionate about the topic and just kind of rambled on. But, um, you know, just mind, I know you, that's what you went to school for. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, what your, what your background is. But, you know, is that a daily thing you like to do or just like in your downtime or let's talk about yeah, that? I've, I've always enjoyed writing. Like, I guess it started when I was a kid. I loved books. Like, I remember going to the library when I was a kid and I would take out like as many books as I possibly could. I think I had like a limit of 14 or something. I'd come home with this big <laughs> bag of books. Um, and I would, I would write stories too. And I would, I would write stories about, you know, girls doing things <laughs> or like once wrote about like a blade of grass or something like really random, silly kid stories. Um, yeah. And then when I went to college, um, I I was really interested in magazine writing, and I was also interested in creative writing. I wrote poetry, and I wrote um, some fiction and stuff like that. But yeah, as it is today, most of the writing that I do is for the publication, um, and a lot of what we do is just kind of just editing everything down. <laughs> like people send us stuff, like like you just said, and they're like, I don't know how to get to, smaller than you're, this. <laughs> you're trying to disseminate it, where it's like, ah, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the writing that we do for this it involves talking with people, 
Um, so I get to interview people, I get to ask them questions, and then I get to turn what they said into an article and kind of weave it all together, maybe do a little research. That's the part that I really enjoy today is kind of synthesizing all of that information into a final you know, product. Um, but writing itself, like I used to have a nice morning practice where I would journal and I would, I would be very creative. And I have uh, three kids. My youngest is two. Uh, so at this time, <laughs> it's with the job and the kids, it's a little hard to, to maintain that, but someday I will get back there. Yeah, no, I can, uh, I like the, the creative writing aspect of it, where I can sit there and just kind of talk all my ideas out there. And then someone puts it all together and it's like, uh, yeah, that's what I meant to say. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that, that, that process, like that when I'm writing something, I'll do the same thing. I'll just dump it all out there. And then I come back in and I'm chopping it away and moving it around and making it pretty. So, so three kids, um, you know, how's that balance going over the last couple of years? It's a lot easier now that we're at home, for okay. sure. Um, okay. I did have a nice, uh, since my, my son who is five was born, I've had a nice balance where I was working at least two days a week from home. And okay. then I was three days a week in the office. Um, so both Jerry Parado and Lisa were really great with that and give me a lot of flexibility, which I really appreciate. And same thing here, like I'm at, I'm at home, we are, have no intentions on going back to the office right now. So, you know, I, I see my kids in the morning and I see them at lunch and, you know, I see them take a little break and say, hi, it's, it's, it's good. Um, but yeah, it can be very busy <laughs> like between the demands of the day. And then you come out, I kind of miss having that little buffer time of, of driving home and just having a little quiet. And now I'm just opening my office door and they're like, mommy, mommy running. Toward uh, me. But you know, you're just like, uh, at least they're not really, how often do you kind of, when you get on one of these recordings with someone, you're just like, you know, you can only tell, I mean, especially a two-year-old, I have a four-year-old. And if I don't take her to school before I do one of these, she'll find a way to insert herself at <laughs> some point. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, my office door did not used to have a, a door on it. It was just an open doorway. We had to install a door with a lock. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm doing something like this, we have a playroom in our basement. So they, I tell our sitter, go down there, have them play. And no one's allowed out for the next, you know, hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> I'll text right. you when I'm done. <laughs> that works. That works. Yes. I just remember when I started doing these, we were just finishing up this house and it was like, you know, some guy would be knocking on the window because he wanted me for something. The FedEx man would find out what my recording schedule is and happen to come at the only time that I'm recording dogs go nuts, everything. It's just, come on. Yes. Yes. Give me a break here. But I also have a dog and I know exactly what you mean. I think she's on the other side of the house right now, but <laughs> we took her out just before I got on here. <laughs> So one, another thing I noticed, um, you interview a lot of C-level people all the time. If some of these things like dog barking, kid interruption, all of a sudden the Zoom shuts off, would it be safe to say that 24 months ago, those executives wouldn't have, they would have been extremely upset and now it happens with them? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if extremely upset, they, they might be annoyed, annoyed. you know, yeah, if they're, they're dialing into a meeting and, you know, you're getting interrupted by a screaming child or something or a dog barking. Yeah, but today it's happening to everybody. Everybody understands. I feel like this whole environment has actually like brought us kind of closer together too, because before when we had those conversations, a lot of the times it would just be like a conference call and you wouldn't see each other and everyone yeah. would dial into the conference, whatever those rooms were. And it would be kind of more formal. You'd run through questions and it wasn't, you didn't get to see their face. You didn't get to um, have that experience. So I think overall this, this whole pandemic has, has made my interviewing process a lot more interesting and, and kind of personal, more personal. No, and that's fair. And then, and then you, when you meet these people, you know, in person for the first time, it's like you've met several times beforehand, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's good to see their face too, because sometimes that, that happened to me in the past where I would interview somebody and not see their face and then see them in person. I only saw their headshot from, you know, 10 years ago or something. And then they'd be like, oh, hi. I was like, wait a second. What is your name again? But when you see them on Zoom, there's no mistake yeah, who they are, right? You're just like, Jesse, you're a lot younger in the photo that you put all over the place than what you are in person. Thank you. Same same here. If you look at the photo, you, you showed the photo of me in the magazine. That's 
I think that was when I first got this job in 2015. So yeah, definitely. Hey, I didn't hey. have glasses then. <laughs> didn't have the gray hair. It, it, it happens. It yes. happens. Now I just can't catfish anyone because people really know who I am. So whatever <laughs> is what it is. <laughs> but, um, you know, so another question I have is as a creative organization like the monitor um, would, you know, you and your team, how hard is it to collaborate when you're not in the same like building on a regular basis? It's, it's not that hard. Um, no. We, you know, have, we communicate through Slack every day. We have, no. you know, weekly staff meetings. We have uh, weekly editorial meetings. And for the most part, if we need to get on a call, we will. Um, me and my colleague, Phil Neifer, we've, we worked together prior to the pandemic. So we had a good working relationship before that. No. Um, but we did bring on a new team member, like after, post pandemic and we hired him never having met him. Um, and that's a little bit harder, you know, trying to get somebody up to speed and he's doing a great job. Um, but overall, I, I feel like it's okay. Um, it's the writing process is kind of really more of like a heads down individual thing. You have a meeting and you talk about it, but then yeah. when you're actually doing it, you need to some quiet space. So being away from each other is actually better because you don't have people like barging in your office every five minutes interrupting you when you're trying to write. Yeah, I guess that kids. would be me. I'm the, I'm the barger. So I guess that would be me that would be disrupting people. So just everybody. Yeah, I do the same thing when I'm in an office. I'm like, hey, I just thought of something. Let me <laughs> let me Stop, tell you about it right now. This. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, excellent, Rita. Um, so I ask everyone who comes on here, if they don't mind this little fun fact about yourself, if you don't mind sharing. Fun fact about me. Um, my high school graduation class was two people, me and one other person. Uh, oh? Yes. I went to school in this very small private Christian school that was in a basement of a church. All of the grades okay. were in one room, and me and my friend were the only we're, we're the class of, of our year. So interesting. Well, that's, in, that's interesting. Were you guys always competing to see who would be better? No, we didn't really no, care. No, <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I did not know that that type of stuff existed. I think I went to, I'm from a small town in upstate New York. So okay. I want to say there was 110 of us. And then when I talked to people, like, oh yeah, we had a thousand people. I'm like, oh, yeah. I can't imagine. So, yeah, that sounds small, like a hundred and... Yeah two is, is yeah no one can ever believe yeah. that when I tell them so <laughs> no well, that's interesting well um you know I really appreciate your time today Rita um and look forward to uh I don't know are you going to any of these conferences coming up I don't know as of right now I'm still kind of undecided I might make it to one or, or two this year but we'll see all right well I appreciate your time today and um we'll be talking soon Rita thank you very much yeah Thanks for having me on, Jesse. I appreciate it. All right.